The original plan was to frame this review as a PSA to not watch the show in an attempt to get it cancelled, thinking I had the influence to do that, but a fourth season was announced even before so much as promotional material for season 3 was released, so I'm thinking, in the wake of Netflix pulling the plug on a lot of its great shows, 13 Reasons Why is here to stay. I'm actually pretty optimistic that they'll end the show at season 4, the characters will probably graduate at the rate the show's been going at, and a solidified final season would make sense for them to renew so far in advance, but if Netflix is going to exploit this dumpster fire, so am I. I've definitely questioned the ethics of continuing these reviews, because I know a lot of people watch the show specifically for the purpose of watching YouTubers like myself tear it apart. But my rationale is that, by going in-depth and going into spoilers, which this video contains, it serves as an alternative to watching the show for a lot of people, and if that audience can eclipse the audience that watches the show because of me, I can sort of justify it to myself. I'm still aware of the fact that I'm performing mental gymnastics to justify these videos, but the bottom line is don't watch the show. That's the point here. I've made the videos I've made and will continue to make videos for as long as the show runs as a means of convincing you guys that it is not worth your time and attention. So we're back. Time to celebrate another season of a show that continues to perplex me. A show whose original premise was holding a tight circle of people responsible for the suicide of a teenage girl, which has inexplicably turned into a murder mystery so full of death and rape and other crimes it's impossible to operate as the after-school PSA it's somehow still convinced it is. This is... They've updated the look of the show yet again. Last season, they deepened the color contrast and switched to a 2 to 1 aspect ratio, which was one of the few things I felt was a tasteful improvement. But this season, they took it way too far. They've gone even more widescreen with a 2.2 to 1 aspect ratio, and the color grading looks like 2011 Film Riot. The colors are desaturated, the blacks are blues, and the contrast is so intense that every scene looks overexposed. This isn't without purpose, as it serves to illustrate the difference between past and present, but when you look at how season 1 did that, with nothing more than a slightly warmer color grade for the past, and compare it to this season, it feels like the only way to illustrate how it feels is with this visual. While the present is high contrast and low saturation, the past is low contrast and high saturation, to the point of looking like a YouTube rewind segment. They still have the flashback shot handheld and present day shot with smooth, often complex camera setups, but switching between the two, which was one of the inoffensive aspects of the previous seasons, doesn't work as well here. When we switch from present day to flashback, the 16 by 9 aspect ratio and natural color palette look kind of drab, which makes the climactic scenes look remarkably uninteresting and amateurish. And then switching back to the 2.2 to 1 aspect ratio and action thriller color palette, it looks like a heightened reality that itself would visually make more sense as a flashback. And because of the aspect ratio, we get these preposterous transitions. Of course, some of them are pretty good, but because there's so many in general, we get a good amount that are just hokey beyond measure. The thing is, I say past and present because the majority of the season, like every other season, follows two general timelines that eventually meet up at the end, but this time, it's so unnecessarily convoluted. Technically, these present day scenes are really flashbacks because the real present is this new character Ani's police interview, which we only see a few seconds of per episode and start out black and white slowly catching up in saturation to this footage as the season progresses. Now I know what you're thinking. Taylor, you just said that this footage looks so heightened that it would work better as a flashback, but now you're saying it is a flashback? The difference is that this footage slowly morphs to match this footage, so in a way, this is more of a flash forward than the present. Flash forward is certainly an interesting concept, and makes me think about why we generally consider the furthest chronological narrative thread in a story to be the present, but there's no reason for the chronology in this particular story to be like this. Season 1 made sense because of the tapes, and then Season 2 tried to recapture that feeling with its testimonies, but needlessly complicated things, even though it was coherent. And the framing of this story feels remarkably similar to Season 2, but only further convolutes things. There's only one narrator overall, rather than changing from episode to episode, but we have testimonies within testimonies, flashbacks within flashbacks, and there's so much going on that it visually tries to convey, but just feels, again, 
convoluted. There's one flashback to season 2 that still has the 2 to 1 aspect ratio, but all the other flashbacks are in 16 by 9, and it becomes so strange visually conveying season 1 material and recent new flashback material in the same aspect ratio, but the small period of season 2 is presented in still a different aspect ratio than those? I get what they were going for, but because the first two seasons are consistent aspect ratios within themselves and different from each other, and they wanted season 3 to have that wider 2.2 to 1 aspect ratio, they should have just committed to 2.2 to 1 for the whole season and, like before, relied on camera setup and color grading, which are already more over the top this season, to convey flashbacks. All of this shifting aspect ratio and color scheme and everything else suggest a lack of confidence in the narrative cohesion, and when you have to go to these lengths to make the narrative easy to follow, I think there may be a problem in the writing. Every movie known for being narratively hard to follow, once you break it down, is pretty simple. That's because it needs to be simple to make something complicated comprehensible. This show feels like it's making something simple complicated just for the sake of doing it. It's not like the chronology is the way it is to make any sort of point. Season 1 was very clearly from Clay's limited perspective, we only know what Clay knows. Even when they cut away from Clay for dramatic irony, it never gave us the information we were interested in. It was more vague suggestions about what might happen, and the bigger question this eventually posed was the reliability of Hannah. It was annoying and manipulative, but it was at least simple. It could be argued that season 2 is trying to make a point about unreliable testimony and jury perception, but we know more than the jury knows, and aside from that, the season was more an ensemble piece than anything. Here, the information seems limited to what Ani knows, even though she conveniently knows just about everything, but we do see some stuff that there's no reason for her to know, and some unreliable narration on her part potentially suggests a similar point about the justice system, especially considering how the season ends, but because there's no actual restriction, the writers can arbitrarily decide what to tell us and what not to tell us. I guess this was the case before, but more than ever, it feels like they're only withholding information so they can have more oh shit moments. There are reveals, particularly regarding who really killed Bryce, that recontextualize so many things, but not in a way that enhances the story. Instead, it muddles up motivations, and because so many lies are at the mercy of writers with the freedom to do whatever they want, I find it impossible to become invested in anything. It feels like the boy who cried wolf, and when something is finally confirmed to be true, it's just whatever because we stopped caring, if we ever cared at all. I think for something like this, the writing needs some sort of restriction to adhere to in order to justify misdirects and red herrings. Obviously by that, I don't mean the writers shouldn't have full creative freedom, but I think they should set up narrative restrictions for themselves in order to establish the rules of the story's world. Once again, the show finds itself unable to exist without a narrator, so in Hannah's place we get Ani, who I mentioned earlier conveniently knows everything about everyone. Her role is so bizarre in the grand scheme of things, but she's clearly a Hannah Baker surrogate for so much of the show. Who else would be so verbose with narration in a setting where verbosity wouldn't make much sense? Why does she give her police interview like it's an AP Lang essay? It frames the show in such a comically epic way that it seems like we're watching Clay Jensen become a mythological hero or a tall tale character. If I could count the amount of times she says secrets. In fact, I'm gonna try. There are things I'm sure no one has told you. Secrets that have been well kept. And yes, the keeper of those secrets is often Clay Jensen. One secret goes back to last spring. Their secrets. Tony Padilla? Also a secret keeper. With the secrets, I know all the secrets. The Zach had a secret. But Zach had another secret. Everybody at Liberty had secrets. Chloe had a secret. Secrets bring more secrets. Chloe kept a secret from Bryce. Their secrets. We all have secrets. The master secret keeper. Secrets are family secrets. Had secrets. But secrets. Any secrets. A secrets. His secrets. Her secrets. The secrets. Monty had a secret. Not only does she use verbiage that doesn't fit the police interview setting, but she gives exposition that shouldn't make sense for what the police know. She's been in Evergreen for like six months now. She's become familiar with everyone. Why does she tell the police? Yeah, I'm the new girl. We get Clay and Ani running around playing their Blue's Clues Mystery Incorporated act the exact way we had Clay and Hannah's hallucination back in season two. We get the same reveal we got about Hannah in season two that she's friends with Bryce. We even get the same sense of unreliable narration from Ani that we got from Hannah. 
They really convinced us they were getting rid of Hannah, and then they just replaced her with a completely recycled archetype. Maybe Ani's a little nerdier than Hannah, I guess, is one of the, the few differences, but there are way too many similarities. Her relationship with Clay isn't terrible, they do have some chemistry, but the writing is always so on the nose. Ani's written as a highly perceptive character, which is fine, but when all her interactions with Clay setting up their relationship just consist of explicitly stated direct characterization, I feel like I'm reading the outline of a story rather than the actual story. Our hero is back, and more than ever, the show wants us to know he's a hero. It wants him to go down in the history books, so we get an unreasonable amount of time spent with other characters explicitly talking about how deep and sad but kind and upstanding he is. We finally have a season of this show where Clay isn't constantly beaten up, but we still have some action for him. And also, he goes to fucking jail. Aside from making him a hero, the show is on a quest of making this dorky kid as edgy as possible. I'm honestly surprised they didn't have Imagine Dragons playing in any of these scenes. I haven't seen enough shows to confirm this, but I feel like it's a pretty tired trope at this point for shows, specifically soap operas, to have a main character go to jail, or turn evil, or something along those lines just to give them a more dramatically varied journey. And that's clearly what they're doing here, which makes me wonder how much of this story they're just pulling out of a hat now that they have all the archetypes in place to recycle other stories. And yes, pretty much every story is recycled, but you gotta do a better job disguising it than this. Because of the writing for Clay, Dylan Minette gives another one-note performance, even though we know he's capable of more. The season tried to address, to some extent, the Hannah hallucinations from last season, but in a strangely half-assed way. Justin mentions to Clay's parents that Clay mentioned that he couldn't get her out of his head, which in any normal context would be interpreted as he can't stop thinking about her. But Clay's dad asks, Like he couldn't stop thinking about her? Or like he was hearing her in his head? Why would he ask if Clay was literally hearing things unless there was some context of Clay's mania that he knew about? And if he knows about Clay's manic episode, why doesn't he do anything? And then in that very episode, Clay has a hallucination of Bryce, and I was suddenly terrified they would have Bryce follow him the whole rest of the season. Fortunately, this never happens again, but it's strange that these hallucinations are mentioned and actually happen again, but they're never brought up as a problem. Once again, the show proves that it does not care about mental illness. It cares about what's dramatic and exciting, and uses affectations of mental illness to convince us we've seen something eye-opening. Jessica's storyline wasn't too bad this season, at least until the reveal at the end, which I'll get into later. This character, who's tangentially part of Jessica's arc, was pretty annoying, and then had a resolution to a conflict that felt underdeveloped, but everything else about Jessica's leadership worked for me. It's perfectly realistic that a protest with good intentions pointing out a prevalent issue won't be taken seriously by the people being protested to, and you can feel the frustration. I thought her speech at the end, along with the subsequent Spartacus moment, was a little hokey and sentimental, but it's far from the greatest offense this season. Her tension with Ani, considering that Ani slept with Jessica's rapist, is also rushed and underplayed, but this is also one of the lesser offenses. I can't tell if Alex is the worst character in the show or just the worst actor. He didn't have the most important role in season 1, but ever since they tried to give him his own thread the past two seasons, it's been impossible for me to care about anything that happens to him. It's partially due to the constant apathy in his voice, but I also feel like no one knows who this character is supposed to be. This season he's just kind of roid raging for a lot of the runtime, and we see later the bigger cause of some of this emotional outburst, but aside from steroid use, befriending Bryce again was a complete betrayal. This is like when Drake collabed with Chris Brown after things fell through between him and Rihanna. How does he redeem himself? By saying sorry? Even before the pivotal scene of this season, which certainly doesn't get Jessica to forgive him anymore because it kind of ruins her life, how did they make amends? Did she just not know he was friends with Bryce? And we're supposed to be cool with that? He's overcompensating with his body because Jessica left him for Justin, but what resolution does that bring? It's not that every story needs resolution, but resolution helps reveal what a certain storyline is about, and there's no indicator of what Alex's storyline could possibly be about. Obviously the show isn't condoning moments like this, but he's framed as one of the good guys, and when he doesn't redeem himself from his overcompensating, entitled personality, what are we supposed to like about him? 
Zack remains the most reasonable character in the show. Even thinking he killed Bryce, he tells everyone to stop their shenanigans and let the police figure it out. Sure, there's a whole thing about the police having an agenda and pinning Clay, but had they just gotten honest testimony from everyone, there wouldn't be an issue. At the very end, reasons are revealed for why honest testimony wouldn't be ideal for two specific characters, but I'll get into that later, because no one else knows those reasons. For all intents and purposes, as far as he knows, Clay leads everyone to a vow of secrecy because he and Tony helped Tyler flee the scene of the school dance he was about to shoot up, and he doesn't want the police to find out. This makes sense to an extent, but Ani tells the police what happened, and they don't care. So Zack was right in that there was no reason to take matters into their own hands. It only complicated everything. He certainly goes a little overboard beating Bryce up, but I think this is one of the more justifiable acts of violence in the show. The extent of the violence is too far, but also it's Bryce Walker. That said, the one scene that doesn't make sense is Zack saying that only a large person could beat up Bryce, implying it was Montgomery. If he were really trying to cover up his tracks, I imagine he just wouldn't say anything at all, unless he suspects that people would suspect that because he didn't say anything he might be guilty, but something tells me that that's not the case. Tyler's the cause of most of the season's legal complications, as I mentioned, and as I also mentioned, he ended up having no legal consequence, at least for the shooting attempt. I was surprised with the direction they took his character in, and he's actually one of the few compelling things about this season in a vacuum, but the context of this season, knowing he was seconds away from killing all these people, makes me a little unsure of how to feel. That's perhaps by design, but that redemption in the audience's eye is maybe a little more difficult than I suspect the writers expected. I think I think they may have been trying to draw a parallel between Bryce and Tyler, the only difference being that Tyler was stopped before committing a terrible act and serves as proof that redemption is possible, but it's not like Bryce could have just been stopped from one rape. He was a repeat offender. More on that later though. I don't know what more to say about Tony Padilla. I keep forgetting he's in high school and not just Clay's older friend. He looks even less like he's in high school than before. He's basically not even going to school anymore, and he still has so much shit on his plate. He has the storied life of a 60 year old man and he's only 18. This time ICE is out to get him? I don't know why this show thought, on top of everything else, it could squeeze immigration into its themes, but it really is trying to tackle every single world issue. This thread is so disconnected from everything else, all it really does is give him more reason to not want to get busted, which is something which I can understand why it might seem justified, but it makes the narrative feel loose and scattered, which is typically a result of lazy writing. Justin has somehow become one of the more likable characters in the show, mostly as Clay's comic relief sidekick, which is really funny considering his arc. I'm no expert in drug addiction, but there's seemingly no symptoms in Justin. He looks fine and healthy, he hasn't adopted any mannerisms or tics, we never get a sense that he's just maintaining on heroin, and the only issues he has playing football have to do with him being impatient and how long it's been since he played so he's out of shape, which I'm sure the heroin doesn't help with, but he gets back on the horse pretty quickly. Because the show had to up the ante on the street danger as well from last season, they visit Seth, Justin's abusive stepdad or mom's boyfriend or whatever their relation is. I should mention after breezing through this montage of Justin dealing via the coffee shop, and we get this hilarious action scene where they just knock the gun out of his hand and he struggles so hard to pick it back up that they manage to get away. In addition to upping the ante on that, the show had to match or excel past season 2 with more guns and knives pulled, murder threats, all that good shit. Last year, that stuff was insane to watch because we were coming straight out of what was mostly a grounded high school drama. But after season 2 and all that, and the fact that the whole premise for this season is a fucking murder mystery, I've become desensitized to all of this violence and crime, and the fact that I've become desensitized to all this stuff in a high school drama is instead what's shocking to me. In lighter criticism, Justin and Jessica also feel like a broken record breaking up and getting back together, but there's so much else wrong with the show, Justin was actually usually a relief to see on screen. In Infinity War fashion, the big bad guy has become the main character, not the hero. I suppose it could be argued that Clay was never the main character and that Bryce is just taking Hannah's prior position, but that doesn't change the fact that this season is about giving Bryce Walker emotional depth. The very concept of this season, a murder mystery about the villain of the previous two seasons, can only be described as preposterous given the context. I'll accept no other word for it. 
In season two, the show made sure, almost overly so, to make Bryce irredeemable. Every instance of potential redemption he gets, he just further proves to be a piece of shit. He reminisces about raping women to his mother. He gets hard just thinking about it. He even burns bridges with people who used to be his friend. And maybe after the trial, you'd think he'd count his blessings and change his ways to play it safe. But even after the trial, he remains a piece of shit. It's only when he goes to a new school and people bully him for being a fucking rapist that he has a change of heart, and suddenly it's good guy Bryce. There are a few moments where he lashes out or does something bad, but for the most part, he's just an upstanding guy the whole season. Every scene he's in, he's defending his mother, being emotionally open with Ani, doing favors for his friends, and not only does this big change happen within him, everyone else changes their attitude towards him as well, independent of his own changes. People keep giving him second chances, and of course, now he's an upstanding guy, so those second chances turn into longer friendships, but the fact that they even went back to him in the first place feels out of character. Jessica even plagiarizes Bryce's words after listening to the tapes in her speech about sexual assault to sexual assault victims, which I understand the poetic intention behind, but it really sends the wrong message. His rationale is, I went too far. Yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer went too far as well. I went too far is what you say when you add too much wacky stuff to your Star Wars movie. Fuck, I was gonna say that. <laughs> Sorry. Can that go in? Sure. I went too far is what you say when you beat someone up in a fit of anger. Even if it were a one-time occurrence, he could say I went too far, and that wouldn't excuse anything, obviously. But he was literally running a syndicate of serial rapists to take women into a shed and rape them. It was an organized operation that lasted months. They had dozens of victims. It's one of the worst things humanly imaginable. I get that they're trying to ask what he should do next if he seriously has had a change of heart, but saying I went too far shouldn't blow over all the horrible stuff he's done. When Ani talks to him about Clay, she says Clay doesn't really like him, and he goes, That's an understatement. Yeah, that's ironic because I raped the love of his life along with dozens of other women. Typical. I can't tell if Ani is supposed to be in the wrong in this scene, but she sort of qualifies that even though Bryce did terrible things, he at least wasn't a liar. I'm pretty sure Ani knows Bryce convinced a whole jury that he didn't rape dozens of women, so I don't know where she's coming from. Say what you will about season one. I sure have. But at the very least, it was simple, and in its simplicity, the characters were able to represent things. Hannah was a martyr, and Bryce was the embodiment of evil behaviors closely tied with toxic masculinity. By trying to give Bryce this complexity, he no longer holds up to his previous symbolism, and he means nothing. I would posit that even though the complexity is necessary for someone to be emotionally invested in what happens this season, they don't even succeed in portraying that complexity. How are we supposed to suddenly retroactively care about this character just because you cherry pick all these moments of him being a good person that were completely absent from his character in the past? If they had planted seeds of his complexity before, then maybe we would have complex feelings about him now? But they changed their objective with the character, and it's obvious. And pulling a complete 180 just doesn't work. But they still tried to give Bryce complexity. They still tried to make this season an elegy for Bryce Walker, which I feel like I shouldn't have to say is completely disingenuous to everything the show tried to stand for. I'm not gonna act like the show was ever successful in getting its message across, but we knew what the attempted message was, and this feels like a complete betrayal of that. Not only is the concept of a murder mystery disingenuous because it's such a silly, heightened reality versus what the show was going for in the past, even though season 2 abandoned whatever grounding season 1 might have accomplished, but season 3 is disingenuous because it serves to ask, what if the rapist weren't a completely bad guy? It really makes me feel like this whole season is an allegory for XXX Tentacion. What the fuck is this show even about anymore? What are they trying to say? And the show still feels like it's trying to be an after-school special, a PSA, and we have moments where characters get in situations only so someone can speak to the audience surrogate, and it's always felt somewhat like a soap opera, but putting more emphasis on Bryce's household makes it feel more like a soap opera than ever before. Well-dressed people standing around a giant house talking about how sad they are. Whenever Bryce goes off in his new school uniform, I feel like I'm watching an episode of Mackenzie Falls. One of the many twists this season is that Ani had a sexual and emotional relationship relationship with Bryce, despite knowing everything he did, and she sort of leads the charge and everyone sort of being like, well, Bryce is a person too. The same way season 2 had people give testimony, and we found out they had some closer relationship to Hannah than we thought, and thus were even more personally responsible for what happened, season 3 takes the exact same structure but uses it for Bryce. 
There's a piece of evidence per episode instead of a tape or a Polaroid, and while it's not always directly linked to the person's relationship with Bryce, it still loosely makes each episode about a certain character, an example of Bryce not being a bad person. There's very little tension in these flashback scenes, they only have tension because of the present day scenes, and the present day scenes are all empty tension. In classic 13 Reasons Why fashion, it mostly consists of people vaguely hinting at some big thing we won't know about until the end of the season. It's scene after scene where we learn virtually nothing. How is Jessica getting a text from Jessica when there's only one Jessica? Someone gets incriminated. We know that because it's not the last episode that this person didn't kill Bryce. And then it flashes back, and it's back to the good guy Bryce show. Season 2 was a mess, but the actual scene to scene interactions and reveals were so outrageous, it was often entertaining in a so bad it's good way. But season 3 is just a drag. We do have outrageous moments, but for the most part, each episode just feels like it lasts forever while nothing interesting happens. It pretends to be exciting because people get arrested left and right, but they're just doing police interviews, further pushing the ooh, what if it's this person narrative. And the big crazy thing they keep hinting at is just another brawl. I'm sure after season two, the writers had the question, how are we going to escalate things past this? Just like all those other moments. A murder could potentially do that, but that's not epic enough, so we have to have a high stakes fight. The trouble is, because they hint at it so much throughout the whole season, it's actually pretty underwhelming when it does happen. If we maybe saw the whole thing go down from one character's perspective at the beginning, the hints at other perspectives might be a little more interesting and suspenseful, but people keep hinting about perspectives of an event we as an audience haven't even seen yet, and when it does happen it tries to show all the perspectives at once and it's a total mess. Montgomery certainly served an interesting role this season. In season 1, he was just Bryce's hype man, and in season 2, it surprised me that a character with such a small role became the key villain in such a pivotal scene with Tyler, which I of course won't show right now. Tyler's arc deals with the fallout of that event, so Monty is sort of a lingering presence, but for as important as he is to the plot this season, he still gets relatively little screen time, which is bizarre because they try to do something very similar to what they do with Bryce. They give us all these scenes trying to make us sympathize with him. The counselor tells him how smart he is and how successful he'd be if he applied himself. He has a shitty home life, he's a repressed homosexual, and even his rationale about what happened was, No, it wasn't sexual assault. I was messing with him. I don't know if this is a suggestion of nuance that many sexual predators are just misunderstood. In the context of Bryce, it certainly seems that way. I don't know what this guy's deal is. So quick to forgive Monty after a beating that most certainly should have hospitalized him. Also, how does Ani know that this stuff happened? Does she? Or is the show just showing us this, independent of her police interview? See what I mean when I say they need to adhere to restrictions? Regarding the Bryce comparison, I will say that at least Monty still displays a lot of the same behavior as before and wasn't a complete 180. So in that sense, it's executed maybe a little better than Bryce, but it still feels underdeveloped due to the lack of screen time, and after putting Monty through what feels like a mini storyline this season, Tyler finally completes his arc by filing a report, getting Monty arrested, and then Monty is fucking murdered in prison. But they had gotten Monty nowhere near the point of his arc really saying anything for them to kill him off. It still felt like they were just starting to flesh his character out, not to mention the fact that another character dies, and everyone just treats it like they hear about this shit every day. I guess I can't blame them, the death toll in this show is up to four now. In retrospect, I should have given season two props for not killing anyone, but it's a bit too late for that. And Monty being murdered in prison isn't even where the absurdity ends. <laughs> After all these shenanigans, I expected some cop-out explanation for who killed Bryce, so I was surprised when it actually was one of the main characters who did it. I was then immediately disappointed to realize it was Alex. He's been such a non-character this season, there's no emotional climax when he tosses Bryce in the river. They go for a fake-out like he's gonna help Bryce after Zack crippled him, and then there's a moment of clarity where he realizes that this person has hurt everyone he's loved. I can't tell if it's the way it's written or the way it was shot, but this whole sequence feels the most slapped together with no effort or anything out of the whole season. In theory, it could be argued that it was meant to portray raw emotion in this spontaneous moment, and by putting careful planning into the scene, they would be diminishing that. But look at the raw emotion in the scene where Zack beats up Bryce, which is one of the most gripping and successful scenes of the whole season, and compare it to this cartoonish sequence. 
Maybe the aspect ratio and color grading have something to do with how pedestrian this supposedly emotional scene looks, but this scene takes place like 30 minutes earlier and works so much better. I think it's just a combination of those filmmaking techniques, the on-the-nose dialogue, and Alex's less-than-compelling character, but this scene was a total dud. They also have Bryce revert to his evil caricature in his dying moments, nullifying all of the upstanding stuff they've shown him do. I'm not really sure how to feel about that, because all the upstanding stuff was unconvincing and manipulative anyway, and this is more consistent with the character he was in previous seasons, but it also makes most of what we saw this season obsolete, further convincing me that the seeming redemption of Bryce Walker was a terrible idea. So after killing Bryce, Alex and Jessica, his accomplice, are off the hook thanks to a bunch of Hollywood absurdity. The whole season, Jessica's been using this horribly fishy alibi. She pretends she was with Justin, which is a cover-up red herring, and then she reveals that she was really in bed the whole time, her alibi being that her dad tucked her in. She uses this line to convince her dad, which is fine, and then Ani uses it with the police, and there's no question about it. Oh, her dad tucked her in? There's no way she could have gone to the scene of the crime then. Obviously, that shouldn't have single-handedly incriminated her, but it's such a shaky alibi, I'd think the police would look for some more substantial evidence before ruling her out completely. And keep in mind, this is after they've eliminated Clay as their prime suspect, so their agenda can't even be used to justify it. Ani eventually walks Deputy Standall through the whole story and pins the murder on Monty. It turns out in this scene that Monty was conveniently murdered like two hours earlier, which means Ani was totally willing to frame a living person for murder. It's not like Monty is a good person, he was in prison for sexual assault, but that seems ideologically opposed to everything this season was trying to say about Bryce. How would these characters feel if, say, Monty were murdered and Bryce were framed for it? Bryce and Monty are more or less interchangeable in terms of morality, so it really muddles what they're trying to say about these people if everyone's content framing someone else for murder. And Standall pretty much knows through coded language that his son killed Bryce, as evidenced by him burning the evidence, so no one has a problem with this. There's this conversation where they're not necessarily happy with what happened, but Ani's like, this is the best thing we could have done given the circumstances. Maybe the best thing for you. Maybe it worked itself out nicely so none of you have to go to prison. Maybe it's convenient that a sexual predator was murdered, making it easy for you to pin the murder of another sexual predator on him. But that doesn't mean it's not morally reprehensible to frame someone else for murder and keep that secret with you your entire life. And then we have this guy seeking justice for Monty as a loose end cliffhanger for next season. It's hard to tell if it's just because he was with Monty and knows they framed him and he's just seeking justice in that sense, or if he's trying to clear Monty's name because he had a bond with him. Once again, their bond was incredibly rushed and doesn't make sense from his perspective, and Monty isn't exactly a name worth clearing, but it does feel like an abuse of the system to frame another person. That said, what's the public gonna say if Monty's name is cleared? Oh, thank god he's not a murderer, just a rapist. And in terms of this being a murder mystery, knowing who it was obviously recontextualizes things, but I'm once again reminded of the jumbled up perspectives and narrative restrictions, how the writers can choose to omit anything they want while pushing the illusion of narrative restriction. When I put it like that, it sounds like one of the many magic tricks of filmmaking, but as a writer, I can't help but feel like it's a bit of a cop-out. What do Alex and Jessica do about the fact that they know Zack was there and beat Bryce up? Why do the police update the public that Bryce was beaten up rather than shot, but not update the public that the cause of death was drowning rather than battery? Why is Ani's relationship with Bryce not mentioned until it's revealed to the audience, after which point it becomes pivotal to her motivations as a character? Trust me guys, I wish I had the answers. <laughs> Just to recap, this season tackles drug addiction, mental illness, immigration, abortion, murder, corrupt police, repression of sexual orientation, trauma from being sexually assaulted, the difficulties of living a normal life after almost committing mass murder, and the difficulties of living a normal life after sexually assaulting people? There's so much going on that it can hardly say anything cogent about most of these things. And there's one more message I'd like to bring up. In the midst of everyone having a change of heart about Bryce and deciding that he's a person too, the main source of tension was that Clay had no sympathy for Bryce. At the very end, he goes to Bryce's house and he tells Bryce's mom that he's sorry Bryce died. She accepts this and tells him he said it before, but she only believes it now. So in this sense, it's as though the big message of the season is that it's bad to not be sorry that a rapist died. Now this could actually be a decently nuanced thing to comment on, but because the season spreads itself so thin trying to tackle everything else, 
it comes off as a pretty simplistic message. It's definitely saying that you shouldn't condone these people's actions because they've inarguably committed atrocities, but it's also saying that to think the world is a better place without them is bad. This isn't something that's not worth inquiring into, and it fits within the grander context of the show being about sexual assault, but due to the nature of a TV show being released season by season, it feels like rather than this being an issue discussed to enrich the main commentary, this has taken over as the main commentary. Maybe season 4 will recontextualize season 3 and make it feel more like a detour in the commentary, but considering the fact that the only narrative thread they've set up for season 4 is the threat of being exposed for framing Monty for murder, and between that and the fact that this season was so obsessed with its own murder mystery, I feel like this show does not have its priorities right. Once again, 13 Reasons Why proves that taking serious subject matter with the integrity of a PSA and trying to fit it into a silly, entertaining narrative is maybe not impossible, but certainly harder than one might think, and this show still has yet to produce a season that accomplishes that successfully. How it holds up to the previous seasons is perhaps a little hard to gauge. On one hand, this season seems to be more ridiculous in concept, but more grounded in practice, which seems like an improvement, but season 2 doubles down on the fact that the show longs to be Riverdale, filled with ridiculous moments and lines, and because season 3 still doesn't succeed in its thematic endeavors, it actually ironically feels like more of a slog than season 2. Season 3 maybe doesn't have a chain of events that starts with premature ejaculation and ends with school shooting, but it also doesn't have anything as fun to criticize the absurdity of as a self-serious chain of events that starts with premature ejaculation and ends with school shooting. There wasn't even a callback to- Wow. You're an actual nerd, aren't you? All we got was FML forever. Instead of Hannah walking into the heavens, we get this scene ripped straight out of the first Harry Potter film. The politics of this season are bizarre in the context of the previous seasons, and again, the mere fact that this show has devolved into a murder mystery is preposterous, but scene to scene, this season is just boring, with no bearing on the truth of the situation because the restriction of information is all over the place. Season 3 goes for more, accomplishes just as little, and is somehow even more difficult to watch. So I'm gonna give it a 3 out of 10. There we go, another season down the hatch. Thank you once again for sticking with me through these tough times. All my links are in the description if you want to see what I have to say elsewhere on the internet. So I'm going to go now, maybe get some sleep. You should do the same. Good night. <laughs>